Sasha, the floor is yours. I'm waiting forward to your keynote lecture entitled Evidence-Based Advocacy. Thank you. Thank you, Georgiana. Uh, well, again, it is my pleasure to, to, to be here today and, and continue the, yeah, the dialogue we were having with my colleagues and friends. Uh, but now we will move to a very interesting topic and is evidence-based advocacy. I would start by telling that nothing of what we have discussed before could be possible if, without evidence-based advocacy. Uh, so before starting here, my disclosures, I do not have personal disclosures, but the Lymphoma Coalition received sponsorship from six companies in our past fiscal year. These are the companies that supported the work we did. And um, everything is publicly available in the Lymphoma Coalition website. And oh, um, I think I'm not sharing yet my screen, no? Uh, I need not yet. First... Would you like assistance? I've just given the presenting right no, to you. No, I, I think I can do it. Okay. Yeah, it's coming. Now you can see the declaration of interest? Perfectly. Okay. Perfect. Um, yes, so when we talk about evidence based uh, patient advocacy, because that's our topic today, um, I want first to define this well, because uh, I'm not sure if everyone in the audience is. is uh, Familiar with, with so it means updating and independent the patients, the caregivers, the family members, and all the community members in a targeted, evidence-based, well-educated, and professional manner. When we talk about targeted, it's about delivering a message specific for an audience, an audience that will be capable to promote the change you are looking for. Evidence-based because it's important not to be based in opinions, but in facts. And for such thing, we will need to collect data. And that's one of the biggest challenges, how to transform the patient experience, the patient needs that may be not necessarily very objective because everything that fields in the area of, for instance, patient reported outcomes, quality of life, could be very subjective uh, dimensions. Uh, but it is our responsibility to transform that into data. Well-educated, because we need to bring robust information and in a professional manner. We need to measure the impact of what we do, meaning that we need to produce outcomes. Those outcomes need to be measurable. And, and if it's not working well, that's okay. I mean, we can correct, align, learn from failures and start again, but needs to have measurable outcomes. So it basically it is based on three core elements, targeted advocacy towards each respective stakeholders. We will need to identify who are the stakeholders that could be helping me in my advocacy work use robust data about patient needs, about patient preferences, use the right packaging of messages to communicate the needs to the respective target group. I want to acknowledge that I'm using the definition that the uh, work group of European Cancer Patient Advocacy Networks, we can, is using in the website, which is the consensus of 27 umbrella patient organizations, pan-European and European patient organizations working in the cancer space. And so when we want to build this advocacy cycle, we need first to identify a problem, the need. Uh, is this uh, something we can deliver research on so we can bring a series of facts can we provide any solution proposals? And what is the message? As we mentioned before in the previous panel, we will need to build alliances, partnerships with people 
And here uh, you will see that I included start with the convinced because it's not only relevant um, to bring people to work with you, but it's important, essential that they will be convinced of what you are doing, that they are truly believers on what do you, you want to achieve because that passion will be fundamental when frustration appears. Then you need to plan. You need to establish goals, objectives, indicators, targets, activities to come with that action plan that will allow you to digest the process and then call to action. Immediately move to, to the right strategy so you can collaborate, coordinate, and supervise what's going on. And as you move through that process, you need to evaluate and reevaluate and consider what are the outputs, if the results are good or bad, what are the learnings, how much impact you are having with your current strategy and have certain flexibility for adaptation. So let's bring some examples and hopefully this will inspire you to do more evidence-based advocacy. Uh, I will start with a with a case that comes within the lymphoma coalition. Every two years we run a global patient survey on lymphomas and CLL. CLL is a chronic lymphocytic leukemia which has the name of leukemia. Probably it was wrong in first place to put that name but it's indeed a lymphoma. This is a biennial online global patient survey that comes uh, live every two years from January to March in 19 languages. Uh, the first one was launched in 2008 and the last in 2022 this year. Uh, is directed to patients and to caregivers. There are different routes and different questions depending on the target. We work with raw data, this is entered, merged and clean. We use the IBM statistical package for the social science. This is a statistical software suite that offers um, a user-friendly interface and a robust set of features that let your organization quickly extract actionable insights from your data. It's an advanced statistical procedure that helps ensure high accuracy and quality decision-making in from data preparation management and to analysis and reporting and this is fundamental because we will need to communicate at the end of the day and bring uh, a call to action with the findings uh, we do demographic comparisons of the patient subgroups and also across lymphoma subtypes and just for you to think about how robust this data it is um, seeing back in 2016, we got 4,129 responses. Was not bad, but was not so good either. Uh, two years later, we go 6,631, much better. In 2020, we got close to 12,000 responses, and we are now analyzing the data that we got this year. Um, so if we go back to some of the data that we have analyzed, and this, if I think, sorry, because I didn't include it in the slide, but this comes from the 2018 Global Patient Survey, we suddenly noticed that the prevalence of fatigue affecting lymphoma patients uh, was quite um, a tendency, no matter the stage of the patient experience and no matter the lymphoma subtype. So fatigue was occurring and impacting the patients before and during the lymphoma diagnosis and as well as during treatment and throughout the survival trajectory. And the percentage of patients was quite big. So we explored a, little, a bit more in the findings where that 72 percent of the patients with lymphoma reported experiencing life impacting fatigue. And this is not the type of fatigue that you and I may have that I'm so tired and no, no, no. This is a fatigue that really diminish your capacity to have a full life. This is the type of fatigue that diminish your quality of life, even your willingness to plan anything. So, uh, and the prevalence was highest 
in the latter stages of relapse remission and disease transformation. And it was getting worse rather than better over time. Uh, but patients were not being educated about fatigue, were not, there were no measurements incorporated in the clinical practice. They were not being referred on to further information or management strategies. There was no support available and there were some barriers for cancer related screening, evaluation and treatment. And, and this, what I'm explaining today could be valuable not only for the lymphoma patients, but cancer in general. And we have recently learned that that COVID has a, also a, a related uh, fatigue. So, um, so what we did, we came with very, very strong messages. We published a report. We did a lot of things targeting different audiences and everything was based on the facts, on the findings of the Global Patient Survey. So as we were moving into action, uh, we were capable to let fatigue being included in the NCCN uh, and ESMO clinical practice guidelines. Now there are four phases clearly defined for doing a screening, for primary evaluation of fatigue, for intervention, and for re-evaluation periodically to patients. There are implemented guidelines for fatigue management, and there are recommendations for fatigue management by interdisciplinary teams. And now more real world data is being collected by registries for further analysis, but also within the clinical trials, many clinical trials in the lymphoma space are now including uh, measurements of fatigue um, and lymphoma patients are being a bit better informed. They know they have access to fatigue strategy uh, for the management and healthcare professionals in general beyond dermatologists are better prepared and at least they have increased awareness about this topic, which is fundamental to, to define the, the change. No? So what can be done with such data, data coming from patient advocacy, uh, from patient global service? We can help to define new core outcome sets. And this is something we have done within the Harmony Big Data project uh, to ensure that quality of life are properly reflected and in a way that it's representative of the disease and the treatments that are available today, and in being respectful with the patient preferences, the prioritization, that ranking that only patients can establish about what the outcomes mean, means for them. We can help to design and validate new quality of life and patient reported outcome tools, because many of the quality of life surveys that we are using today in clinical, trials and also in clinical practice were designed 20 years ago, 10 years ago, where the treatment in armamentarium was no the same that what we have today in the market. We can help to define endpoints within clinical trials, but also for clinical practice and, and really bring quality of life to primary endpoints. We can provide insights to regulatory bodies to understand that when we talk about efficacy, it's not only relevant the overall survival, but it's important what does it mean for the patients. When we talk about safety, this is not only about the adverse effects that uh, are measured as signs, neutropenia, what is happening in the blood, you know, those kind of things that are essential. Of course they are, but it's also fundamental how these things are translated into the patient's the, uh, life disruption. And we can provide insights also to, to health technology assessment bodies, to payers, to define the value of the new medicines, of the new interventions that come to, to the market. But there are many other examples. Um, we also learned through the patient global patient survey, uh, and this data comes from a few years ago also, that not every patient, not every lymphoma patient, at uh, the moment they were getting the diagnosis, were getting information about the type of sub, the, the subtype of lymphoma they had, and and this is uh, really uh, dramatic because um, 
then you have misunderstandings and you uh, you don't really know uh, what treatments are available for your disease, what could be the course of your disease. Uh, you know, it's, it's when the patients become very confused about why if I met someone that has a lymphoma and in principle has the same as disease as I have, but we are not getting the same attention. I'm having treatment. He's not having treatment. Uh, he's under one thing that they call like watch and wait and I don't know. And, and there were a lot of doubts and, and, and there were a lot of levels of of um, satisfaction, let's say, um, an activation in the patients according to the level of understanding they had of their subtype. And lymphoma is quite complex because there are more than 80 subtypes of lymphoma and some of them are aggressive, some of them require immediate treatment, but some others not. They don't require immediate treatment, they are indolent, they can become chronic, some are curable, some are not. So it's important, it's fundamental to get to, to understand what disease you have. And so we came again with a big campaign targeting different audiences where we were emphasizing lymphoma in itself is not one disease. There are 80 subtypes and it's important to inform the patients and we change a lot of things. So we move from 60% of the patients not knowing what subtype they had to today um, being capable to, to, to tell that um, most of the most of the uh, uh, suddenly uh, sorry um am I connected? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Is that that I, I got a message in my computer that something was not working well, so I was in fine. Yeah, the network is not good, sorry. but we turned off your video okay. and we hear you perfectly. Okay, sorry for that. Um, so we moved from 60% of the patients not knowing what subtype they have to today, we are close to 80% of the patients knowing perfectly what subtype they have. So it's it's a dramatic change. And we are moving now to another big area that it's not to collect data uh, ag ag um, um, uh, group data. Because if you see, for instance, the Globocan um, data, uh, when they report cancer statistics, they report Hodgkin lymphoma and non-Hodgkin lymphoma. That's not helpful when we want to, to collect um, what is working well at healthcare uh, system, what treatments are available, and when we want to advocate for better access for these specific subtypes or what kind of support patients need, depending on the subtype they have, what testing technology is essential in a given country. So it's important to understand the different uh, needs and the statistics in terms of mortality, morbidity, incidence, prevalence, and access to diagnosis and treatment. So we are moving now to advocate in that sense, working with registries, with governments, and, and so on. But I don't, I want to see beyond uh, what else is out there. And, and this is a perfect example of super, super high level a patient advocacy effort, uh, or, or and of course, evidence-based advocacy. And this came from the uh, Leukemia Foundation from Australia. They made this super valuable document. Uh, all the data that is in this document is coming from a, a, a big survey uh, where more than 3,200 3, people living with blood cancers nationally participated, but they came also with other stakeholders. They work through different strategies to collect information and publish this report. This is a state of the nation blood cancer in Australia report and this set up 
an ambitious agenda and calls for a strategy coming from the governmental leaders in a coordinated action to empower the patients, but basically to improve equity of access, accelerate research, and catalyze a health system reform, a deep health system reform. So it's kind of a um, roadmap uh, to, for a person-centered a strategy for uh, the management of blood cancers in Australia. I invite you to, to download this document. It's available, publicly available in, in, in internet because it, it can provide a fantastic roadmap for any country. I mean, the, the information is based on Australia, but it's perfectly uh, applicable to other settings. This is another example, more recent example. This was uh, done, uh, a work done by the Global Cancer Coalition Networks. This is, um, this is started with six global cancer coalitions that came together at the very, very, very beginning of the pandemic. Uh, now we are, I think that 10 uh, global cancer coalitions in, working together and this is a report that came as a result of all the research uh, through the patient organizations to understand how COVID disrupted the activity of the patient organizations but also the life of the patient and and caregivers I mean and the, and the cancer patients and, uh, and caregivers and again it provides a roadmap on how to better address these disruptions and um, it's a wonderful document that was presented in a congress as well it was well received and again it can be a perfect example in how to cooperate to bring the best uh, information possible for doing um for doing advocacy work um, i will leave it here just in case there could be some questions, I want to conclude with this fantastic quote from James Levin uh, that tells people have a right to their own opinions, but not to their own facts. Uh, evidence must be located, not created. And th this is quite funny because it is true. I mean, the facts are there. You just need to collect them to uh, structure the message and to disseminate. And opinions not backed by evidence cannot be given much weight. Uh, and this is something that really guides the work we do. Um, just for those who don't know us, the Lymphoma Coalition research focuses on the experience of patients with lymphoma. We work in two equal pillars, information provision and everything that comes from research to ensure that the advocacy we do and that it's oriented to ensure impact and to change the lymphoma ecosystem to produce better outcomes will be based on on evidence and with this i conclude my presentation thank you so much thank you natasha it was really informative and detailed one uh, we we saw that evidence-based patient advocacy is really important and it's absolutely logically related to data access, collecting, analysis. So what is the biggest challenge in front of evidence-based advocacy? Or if it's just one or, or several? I think are several. I mean, one is, I would say funding sometimes and um, yes uh, an engagement because uh, collect data depends on how capable you are to influence others to provide the answers you need i mean you do nothing if you launch a global patient survey but if you don't get the responses it won't serve but it's not only that you need to follow a scientific methodology and you need to ensure that the data is going to be validated at the end of the day to be perfectly incorporated by other stakeholders that have in their hands that change. Um, so 
the engagement of your community is fundamental and this is something you build every day. You cannot wait to launch your survey to, oh, oh, now I need to ask all my partners, you know, to disseminate and to push people to provide answers. No, you need to be, uh, to build your credibility and your community every day. Uh, and, and, and this is a constant effort and, and it's a changing effort because the, the priorities for the people change. And we have seen very recently with the COVID, how suddenly everything was about COVID. We have been working quite close to the, uh, in response to the Ukraine conflict uh, by evacuating patients to receive treatment and care that was not anymore provided in Ukraine. Uh, and we were capable to do that work not only because we got the, the right partners, but be, because we were credible and because we had a, a community uh, already functioning well and partners perfectly well recognized and engage with the work we were doing. So it, that, that's something that, that it's uh, quite challenging. Um, funding, as I told before, and funding because there are not many opportunities for funding for patient organizations besides those that come from the pharmaceutical companies. That's the truth. Uh, in Europe, we have some opportunities coming from the European Commission, but we all know that the criteria to get access to those opportunities are quite strict and, and deep, and, and not every organization has achieved yet that level. And that does not mean that they are not doing a good work, that they have very good governance, and they are very well manage patient organizations, but they are not yet there. And so there is there is one side calling for more independency, more, you know, less dependency on the pharmaceutical companies. And it is true that we all are looking for that. But then you have the, the, the reality and the reality is that there are not many funding opportunities. Um, and I would say also that the capacity to deliver the message, to deliver the message and to target the right audience at the right time. Sometimes it's about being there at the right time. And, and, and those are some of them, and, but not, not only those. I mean, we could yeah. be speaking one day about the challenges. It's a, it's a complex situation indeed. And based on your experience, are patients willing to share their data? Yes. 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 Okay. And in my experience, patients are much more <laughs> willing and open to share their data. What they want to know is that the data is going to be used with uh, responsibility and for the benefit of other people that could be facing the same today or after, I mean, or, or are coming next. Um, there, are, there are several barriers for sharing data today, and I think that we have more barriers than, than what we could have imagined before. I am a truly believer that we need to protect data, that's true, but this cannot go against the, the the capacity to speed up advances and to speed up learnings. So patients are truly open to share their data if they know that this is going to be anonymized and if they go that uh, there will be, uh, you know, fundamental principles um, to manage yeah. that. Yes, they need a guarantee that uh, exactly. it will be securely yeah. Uh, keep kept and used on purpose. Exactly. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. It was it was really detailed and informative presentation. And thank you for being with us today.
Thank you for inviting me. It has been a pleasure. Hopefully, I will meet you uh, in the future, in the near future. And um, I'm, I'm open. I mean, I'm very happy to to answer any other question. Uh, um, my contact details are available. Uh, so I would be more than happy to be able to cooperate with anyone interested. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a Thank you. You too.